been on this stage a lot of times, but I've never actually been up here without Ben, my friend and mentor. Uh, when I was a student here, I was a member of the Pitchforks, Duke's oldest a cappella group. And Ben performed with the group and served as our faculty advisor. About five years ago, Ben got sick, cancer. And though he told us very little about what was going on, some of us got the sense that he knew that he was fighting a losing battle. I had lost my own father to cancer, so I began to visit him pretty regularly, coming down from DC to ask him questions and spend time in his apartment and just listen. Now, a lot of people know the legend of Ben Ward. He was a child prodigy of sorts. Uh, he studied piano under Coretta Scott King, and as a teenager, ended up playing the organ at Martin's funeral. He spoke more languages than humans have fingers, and he was a stubborn man. Uh, when he was against the Vietnam War, he simply didn't eat for a month, and then failed the physical. I could tell you a lot of stories about Ben, but I'm most interested today in telling you about one, which was my last conversation with him. I had come down from DC in October of 2013 to spend time with him, and as the day drew on, it became very clear that Ben didn't want me to leave. He began talking to me about his own vision of his funeral. And he, a classical music enthusiast, had picked out the musical selections that he wanted to play. So we sat there, and we listened to them together. Ben started crying, something I had never seen before. And I cried. And when that music came to an end, he handed me the CDs and had me put them back so that I would know where to find them next time. As that day came to an end, Ben wrapped me in his unreasonably long arms, and he said something that I'll never forget. He said, I just wish in my time here I could have been more helpful. Now, I need you to recognize the absurdity of that statement if you don't know Ben, because Ben taught thousands, and he mentored hundreds, and for the better part of 10 or 15 years, he served dinner at Urban Ministries of Durham almost every night, logging more than 10,000 hours. Ben has served more meals and been more helpful than I will ever be. But somehow he was stuck on this idea that he wanted to be more helpful. Because we talk of service, and we talk of giving back, and we think of those as things that we do for them. I believe something slightly different, and it's something I learned in my time working with Ben and talking with Ben. And I believe that we actually build energy, we cultivate dignity, and we convince people that they matter by allowing them to be helpful. That drives the work I do in DC, and today I'm going to tell you the story of four of my kids, Treshawn, Arvian, Zimitri, and Kair. And I'm going to tell you about how, instead of helping, by us allowing them to be helpful, we create a more powerful change and build more energy in doing so. I run an organization in Washington, D.C. called Reach Incorporated. And at Reach, we hire high school kids to be elementary school reading tutors. What's unique about what we do is that we hire those kids that require additional support, not the kids that are already thriving. By turning them into teachers, we support the students, but the tutors improve at the same time. So after I tell you about my four kids, I'm going to do something I never had the courage to do when Ben was alive. I'm going to tell him that he was wrong. I believe that the cultivation of dignity and the, d the discovery of mattering in this world happens in four stages. Pre-engagement, engagement, realization, and growth. And when we met Treshawn, he was undoubtedly in pre-engagement. When we met Treshawn, we asked him to be part of our cohort at Ballou Senior High School. We told him that we thought he had the ability to change the life of an elementary school student. And he, put simply, didn't believe us. For the better part of a year, Treshawn came sparingly. He would occasionally show up to training sessions where we help our tutors develop lesson plans, but he would almost never show up for tutoring sessions. The idea of helping a younger student was simply too intimidating to him. We lose a lot of kids during pre-engagement. We often call it disengagement. But in reality, we say they don't want to learn. We say that they don't care, 
but we forget a really important word, yet. And because of that, at Reach, we get to see some cool things. Because this year, Treshawn's back and showing up consistently. He comes to our sessions, he's engaging, and to a little boy named Anthony, Treshawn is a really big deal. Just last week, I got to watch the two of them work together, reading a book about animals and their babies. Anthony was wearing a ridiculous oversized hat, which was Treshawn's, when he turned and said, wait, how come kangaroos got spouts? Treshawn just looked at him, sort of smiled, and said, um, dude, they're pouches. Stepping back, seeing a picture that we wouldn't have an opportunity to see otherwise, we recognize that Treshawn is starting to engage. And in that same room, you can meet Arvion, who's well into that engagement process. But she wasn't always there. As an eighth grader, Arvion got thrown out of school. And as a ninth grader, she didn't quite pass. But last quarter, Arvion had no grade lower than a C. She's beginning to step up her game. We talk often about the kids that are far from perfect, and we rarely understand that in reality they're halfway to incredible. Because at the end of last year, standing in a circle talking about their favorite reach moments, it was Arvion, not smiling, hard-shelled, difficult to engage Arvion, who when she heard the students saying positive things about their tutors, whispered under her breath, I might need to leave. These kids are going to make me cry. And though Arvion still presents challenges to us, and plenty of them, she is doing things every day that we see as growth. She shows up. She takes on multiple students. She supports our instructors. And we're seeing that improvement. It's not linear. We still have our challenges. But like Trey Sean, we try to cultivate that energy by noting it directly to them over and over. Because when you walk with students through those first two stages, you get to see something beautiful, which is that third stage, realization. Zimitri is now an 11th grade tutor at Perry Street Prep. And she is probably the most popular tutor we've ever had, because everyone wants to work with Zimitria. She is just now beginning to understand what the world looks like from the eyes of her students. She's starting to see that she matters to those kids. She doesn't yet realize, however, that she matters, period. Zimitria wrote a recent essay where she said, before reach, I didn't have a reason to try because I didn't feel like I was worth anything. I didn't know what it was like to have a kid look up to you and care about you like that. I thank reach for that. A couple weeks ago, Zimitria's school was closed because of a snow day while the local public schools weren't. So despite having no obligation to do so, she showed up to work anyway. It turned out to be just the two of us. But Zimitria worked and provided individual attention to seven different elementary school students, getting them through the lesson and enjoying it along the way. I didn't matter. The world got better when I stepped out of the way. Once a struggling student, Zimitria made honor roll this year. She earned a promotion to junior staff, our highest honor. She talks about being a nurse or a pediatrician and she talks about adopting or fostering children. But this wasn't always her journey. There were 14 years before we knew Zimitria. And in the three years we have known her, we could have tutored her. We could have helped. But instead, we let her, which for her was a much more powerful experience. She's beginning to understand that she matters in this world. We already knew. And now, Kair knows, because Kair's in that fourth stage. Growth. Last year, Kair was an 11th grade tutor at Eastern High School, and he worked with a young reader named Zariah. Now, Zariah didn't like reading, but she loved Kair. And he, also a published children's book author, would guide her through lessons. And at the end, they would read her favorite book, his book, together. Kair began to recognize his influence in the world. He volunteered to do author readings at local public schools. He signed up to volunteer with a second literacy nonprofit. He began to step into his own awesomeness. And we got to see that growth play out in a really cool way. Because when I ran into Zariah's mom earlier this year, she told me that Zariah loves reading more than she ever did before. But she also told me that Zariah now likes to play Reach. 
She likes to grab her own copies of Kyer's books, and she likes to read them to her little brother. So not only did Kyer teach her, Kyer is already unleashing her potential to teach others. And that is why Ben was wrong. Because Ben thought he stopped being helpful when he left this earth. And that's far from the truth. Because 15 years ago, on this stage, Ben made me be helpful. The pitchforks weren't very good at the time, and they didn't have a leader. And Ben was by far the most accomplished musician and most respected authority in that room. He could have helped, but instead, he made me. And the leadership lessons I learned as part of that experience now allow me to help my REACH family help hundreds of people become helpful. Ben thought he was out of time to be helpful, but he wasn't. Ben matters, present tense. Because 50 years ago, Ben was Kyer's age. And before Ben was the organist at Dr. King's funeral, before he was a professor and a dean here for 25 years, before he served all those meals, before all of that, Ben began his studies at Morehouse College. Last month, Kyer got into Morehouse. For all that I have become, for all that Kyer is becoming, and for all that Zariah will be, Thank you, Ben.